Red Blue JD. Thank you, Alice, for organizing the Art Talks and for inviting us to present. Um, I'm going to close here. So it's very nice to be back here. Uh, I used to be a teacher at this school, so it's very nice to see that we still do the Art Talks and to see some old faces. So, oh, yeah, there you go. So we're going to do a presentation in which I'm going to do a short presentation of my research. So as an introduction of the work that the fellows are doing at the African Design Center. So as Alicia has said, I'm an architect. And when I was working in Rwanda, apart from teaching at KIST, uh, I was also working, uh, designing some, uh, especially early childhood development centers. And some of them were in the refugee camps. So because of that, uh, I started, that's why I started the PhD, because I had questions on like, how can we do these interventions different? Or how, how can we learn from these interventions? And also, how can we convince UNHCR that it's important to have a designer? So when I started my research, this, you don't see it very well, but that was uh, one early childhood development center in Kigeme when the CAM started in 2012. And they call us, um, the company, like Asa Studio, they call us to do an early childhood development center there. And they were like, just do whatever, because it's going to be better than this. And our answer was like, but if we, if with the same money and the same time, we can do something good, how about that? But normally, we had a lot of discussions with UNHCR about the value of design or what, 
does it mean to have a child-friendly space or what does that mean for children development? You can pass again. So that's one of the schools that we did, not in Kigeme, but in another camp that is besides it, Mugobwa. So you see the difference, there are some differences, right? You can already tell that it's not only the fact, well, apart from that one is blue and the other one is red. <laughs> there are other differences like furniture, lights, right? Like there is a blackboard, there are different types of furniture and colors. So initially my research was about how, how can we measure the, the effects of design on young children development. Could we say like, okay, the fact that we have ventilation and lighting improves learning in this and this other way. And the fact is that in refugee camps we can't. We can't because there is not enough information. So there is not enough information on children development. So you don't have any information on children development until chil kids are 12 year old and they do the national exams after primary school. And you have some information on nutrition or health development if they have had problems. But that's not enough to actually make an, an evaluation. So it would have taken me 10 years and a team of you know, psychologists and nutritionists to actually manage to do this research. So maybe you can pass the next. So when I started the investigation and some of the students at KIST helped me, and came with me to the refugee camps to gather information and talk to the parents, the children, and the teachers. What, uh, what I realized is that more important than just looking at how the school building was affecting is like what were, what were the elements of the camp that were affecting young children development. And actually, if you see here, like that was when we were trying to define how, where do the kids spend their time, the majority of their time is spent out of school. So only three to four hours a day, kids go to these early childhood development centers, and only like 40% of the kids go to these centers. Therefore, if you actually do a very good design, you're affecting a very tiny piece, right? So my idea shifted from the research, and why I started doing is like, can we start mapping out what are these spaces and start having information on like, what are the spaces that are affecting your children's development so that later we can do research like the one that the fellows are doing. So we can actually, now that we have this baseline study, we can say, okay, we see that there is a big problem. You can pass to the next. We can see that there is a big problem in different spaces and that the parents and the caregivers and the children find you, don't, you cannot read there. And also you cannot read on the side, as I can see. But the, the elements on the top so these were problems, what are the causes of harm for young children? And the majority of the causes of harm were directly related with space. So all the ones on the top are related to the home. And then all the ones there are related to the street and these ones here, only these ones here are related to the school. And the gray and the yellow ones are related to, like the yellow ones are more related to parent relationships. And, and the gray ones were related with uh, nutrition and health. So you can pass to the next. Or not. <laughs> so, so starting when, when I started doing the first days of the research, I realized that actually it was more important than we do this baseline study and we start identifying what are the spaces that are causing harm and which ones are positive. So for example, uh, as Alicia said, I'm doing this research not only in Rwanda, but in Kenya and Uganda. And you see the spaces that the parents and the caregivers note like the spaces that are most used by children. And they are the early childhood development center, the street, and the child-friendly space. And, and for Rwanda, you see it here. Clearly, like they say it's the early childhood development center, but we know that they only spend three hours there, or four hours there. But then child-friendly space, the fountain, and the street. And this wasn't counted the time that they spent sleeping at home. So that you can add that also as one of the spaces that are most used. So then 
my question passed from like measuring how these buildings affect to like what is the role? Like how could we use architecture to create new knowledge, right? Like how can we use architecture to actually raise awareness of the importance of space and transform space? So I started doing lots of maps and showing them to UNHCR, to the refugees, and to different people involved, and seeing how, like, how, how having more information and how using architecture or design as a universal language can use in these interactions. So one of the problems that are found like, in terms of children development is that, as I said, everything is focused in the school. And nobody really looks at what happens with the houses or what happens with the common spaces. And one of the problems about that is that, as you can see, most of the, of the camps and the refugees are in this area, but most of the knowledge comes from this tiny area, specifically Geneva. But so there is not a lot of information, and what they do is like, okay, we have some information from this camp in Palestine or this camp in Kenya, so we take this information and we apply it in all of the camps. And therefore now everybody's doing early childhood development centers, but nobody's looking at how the house is affecting in early childhood development. Therefore many kids cannot go to school because of problems in the house, but that's not addressed. This is a little video, wait, wait one second. So another problem, another assumption, right, is that the, these camps are very short. Um, no, one second. So, but we know now that the majority of the camps stay more than 10 years and 40% of the camps last more than 20 years. But still the camps are designed to be temporary. And the houses are not called houses, they are called shelters. Shelter from the weather or shelter from attacks, but they are designed as such. They are not designed as homes or designed as learning spaces. So here is just an, ev an evolution of the refugee camps in in the African continent, so that you can see that over time, you can put play, so if you go there. Okay. Yep. So you see that there are no less refugees. Actually, there are more refugees every time. Right? No, no problem. So, yeah. So, and also you can see how different conflicts, right, cause more or less refugees and in different times. So you will see, for example, in the 70s and 80s when there were like wars of independence and there were some conflicts in the countries that were becoming independent. Or you will see, for example, in 94, you see Rwanda and you see the places where the Rwandese went. But the, but the fact is that there is no a reduction of refugees but an increase on refugees. And that's not only happening in in Africa, but it's happening everywhere. You can go to the next. Another problem is, and you cannot see this, so maybe I will just pass, but like nowadays we have 66 long-term refugee camps in East Africa only. Long-term camps means that it has been there more than five years and there are more than 5,000 people. So we have around four, like 8.5 million people in camps and only 40% of the refugees choose to be in camps. So that means that there is a very many of them don't choose to be in camps because the people that go to camps are actually the people that cannot self-settle or go to urban and cities. It's people that have a lot of kids or people like um, widows or single moms or old people or handicapped. And then over time you have also, you know, whole families. But the idea is that if you can, you don't go to the camp because you know that there will not be easy way out. You can go. So my research focuses in, in like in Rwanda, in, in Kenya, in the north of Kenya and in southwest Uganda. And these, these like little blurbs here are the different conflicts that produce refugees. So, for example, in Rwanda, all the camps are only, well, five of the long-term camps are Congolese refugees only, and the newer camp 
uh, in Mahama is for Burundians. But if you see, for example, in Uganda, you have an overlap of many different conflicts. Some of the camps uh, I'm researching in, in Uganda, one is as old as 56 year old and has 12 different nationalities. And for example, Kakuma in Kenya also has 12 different nationalities. So it depends on like, you know, the distances or like the easiness of getting to different places. You have variety. So camps are very varied. The camps in, you can pass the next. So again, you can't see much, but, but this is the camp. This is one of the camps in, in Rwanda. These are all at the same scale. So you see one little camp in, in, Uganda, in Rwanda. Oh, maybe we will have yeah. the view. And this is this camp I was talking about that is 56 year olds, right? So you see the differences. Even like physically, there is a lot of differences. The camps in, in Rwanda are very concentrated and dense. And up to 2000, up to the beginning of this year, you couldn't move out of the camp, whereas the camps in Uganda, as you can see, are more spread. And they actually are very similar to normal settlements. So there are many differences that are not accounted for because of this lack of information that I was talking about before. We have all these camps in Asia and in Africa, but the information is scarce and doesn't really get to the people that makes the decisions. Yep. This is Kiziba, it's uh, one of the oldest, refugee camp, well, it's the oldest refugee camp in Rwanda, and I'm not going to extend on this because uh, the fellows will explain a little more about it. Um, but just to figure that is, for example, very relevant for young children development is the fact that 45 people share a latrine, and by a latrine, I mean one hole, not a block of latrines, and none of these latrines are child friendly. So children do not go to the latrines. They go anywhere else with the problems that that also carries. So there are many things that by, by doing these maps, none of these maps existed. I made these maps with Google Maps and going to the site and checking and like going again to, you know, asking for satellite imagery because some of them, you don't even have new photos. But the people in the camp, build new schools, build health facilities, and they don't even have a plan. So for example, one problem in 2011, I was in Kiziba doing an evaluation of the educational facilities, and one school was falling down and was just built like one year ago. And there were like gigantic holes on the floor and like cracks, and they didn't know what happened. So I started asking around, and one of the older refugees was like, well, that was a place full of latrines, and they cover them. But there is such fast shift of humanitarian workers and no data, so that the new humanitarian worker that was in charge of making the school didn't have the information and didn't ask the refugees. So they built the school on top of an old bunch of latrines. So what happened is the floor started uh, compacting when the school was on top, and therefore you had a 30 meter whole, all latrine past. So I'll try to go faster now. So doing this evaluation of the different spaces and talking with the parents and with the children, we came up with a division of the different spaces for education into formal, non-formal, and informal education. So the formal education spaces were those spaces where it was top-down organized and they got a certificate at the end and it was maybe, you know, um, under the Minister of, of Education from the country that were hosting the refugees. The non-formal education, well, uh, learning spaces were those spaces that were organized by the community, but they were organized. It was just not free play or like informal learning, but there were some content. So, so they will explain a little farther about this non-formal. And the informal is what we were counting like houses, streets, common spaces, and toilets. Well, I'm missing a picture, but, and then the pictures are pretty dark anyways. But uh, these are some images of formal educational facilities. 
Some of them are more design, as you can see here, and some of them are more like still in mud. Yeah, sorry, you have to keep uh, doing this. The projector is not the best. Yeah. So that image is from Kiziba, and these two are from Kakuma in Kenya. So I don't know if you see the amount of kits. So that's another problem. The fact that you don't have a lot of schools makes that you have 200 kids with one teacher. I don't know if you have tried to be with like two or three three-year-olds at the same time, but imagine having 200. You don't teach anything. You just close the doors and hope for the best. So many parents do not bring the, the kids to school because that's what, you know, they don't really learn. So unless they have to work and they have a place to put the kids, they don't really bring them to school. Yep. Oh, I don't know. Pass the next. Then there is the non-formal educational facilities. This is what I was talking about, that the communities organize themselves. So they, like the fellows will explain a little more, but these are two of the home-based ECD facilities in, in Mugobwa, actually where you see all the kids with the white toilet paper on the head. So that's the uniform. So these spaces, what they do is they use uh, interstitial spaces, spaces in between homes, and an NGO gives them a mat. And so they put the mat on the floor, they get the uniform on, and they're in school. So, and this, this type of organization, I think I'll let them explain a little more, but it's very interesting because the students have more access. This is for the little, little kids that will not be able to walk all the way to the center, the formal. Yeah, next. And these are some houses. So the, the standard of UNHCR for a house, for a shelter, is a three by four meters, so 12 square meters. The average family in the Rwandan camps is around 6.5, so six or seven, not upon five person. But so you have around like an average six or seven. So you have families of 12 in a 12 square meter house. And you can imagine the problems that that brings for, you know, for children development, for parents that are tired and have all the kids running around. These are some of the common spaces these three are in Kiziba. This is a dumpster where normally kids play around, <laughs> close to it, that we've visited. And this is how, like, Kiziba is so dense that these are the type of paths in between the houses. And you know that Rwanda is not flat, it's pretty steep, so when it rains, you can imagine what happens with this wall. You can actually see a little bit. So that's another of the problem. There is a lot of, like, uh, breaking legs and breaking other pieces and not good health assistance. So many kids also do not go to school when it's rainy season because it's dangerous. And these are in Kakuma. It's fine. These are some toilets. I don't think I need to explain what that is. But that doesn't have a fence, right? That's a pit, like that's a overflow pit latrine. Full of overflow pit latrine stuff holes in playgrounds. This camp here that still has the toilets like this was built in 1997 and the toilets are still like that. Now you understand why kids do not go to the toilets. Yep, next. So why I think that the research is important and why I think it's important that we have also architects involved even if there are not many is that this here, what, what do you see here? in the image in the bottom. Nothing. Desert. Yeah, so this is a desert close to Kakuma. Kakuma is a refugee camp in the north of uh, Kenya. So this place is 15 kilometers towards the border. And being close to the border is not a nice thing for a refugee camp because uh, maybe Moses can explain a little bit later, but you can suffer like rebels can get in back, right? If you're close to the border where the conflict is happening and you have refugees seeking refuge, many times you have in Rwanda for many years, there was children abductions in Kiziba refugee camp, in Gihembe, because 
the rebels will get in at night and get the refugee, like the kids. But the problem is that this is, the, this is what they are planning to build here, and it's called a sustainable integrated settlement. So you change the level, you don't call it camp, now you call it sustainable integrated settlement, and you build it in the middle of the desert where they have to put pipes, 15 kilometer pipe to Kakuma that already doesn't have a lot of water, and they take the water from boreholes that causes a lot of conflicts with the local community to make this. And you see this green, this is arable land in the desert. You can pass the next. So the problem when we, you know, when you're just like, okay, let's go, let's do, you know, we don't want to build camps. Camps are bad for people. Let's do sustainable settlements. Let's call it sustainable settlement. But this plan, the engineer that did this plan did the exact same plan for five other camps in Ethiopia 10 years ago. And they were called camps. Now they're called sustainable settlements. And we're going to plant here enough to sell. So I let that there. And now the fellows will explain a little bit the research. The research is on, on home-based ECD spaces and child-friendly spaces in, in Kigali, well, in Rwanda, sorry. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, they on TV. Yeah, sorry.